We live in what's called now a postmodern culture. This is increasingly a term that's used, and yet it's a very difficult uh, term to understand. In fact, it's kind of like a slippery beast in the water going through murky water. And postmoderns really don't even like to be described with words, they would rather be like a teenager who says, now don't put me in any categories. And so there is some truth to that, but yet there are some characteristics of the modern world, and there are some characteristics, I think, that we can see of the postmodern world and how the generation that is my age, 60 and older, largely function more in a modern world, and those that are 40 and under, are functioning more and more in a postmodern world. And this presents a lot of challenges to the church. And we've looked at the importance of new wineskins. And so we'll be looking at some of the wineskins that are older, that we're in a modern world in terms of churches. And we'll be looking at some postmodern examples of churches and how we can thrive in a modern world and a postmodern world if we follow Christ. Uh, there's a book by Leonard Sweet, and it's called Postmodern Pilgrims. And in it, he describes the characteristics of postmodern culture. And I think it's the best description I've seen. And he says that postmodern culture is characterized by being epic. It's all about experience, participation, image, and community. And then I devise kind of the corresponding idea of, well, what does the modern world look like? And I think it looks more like a, a culture that roars, that it's committed to reason, observation, absolutes, and responsibility. And so that's what we're going to develop a little bit, is uh, the difference between the church in a modern culture and the church in a postmodern culture. So let's look at this first area, and that is the modern church that's committed to reason. I think that this is one of the reasons why the church of my generation, my father's generation, my grandfather's generation were very much about a reasoned approach to Christianity. Apologetics was very important. Clear Bible teaching in churches was very important. Traditional hymns that were full of words that communicated reasoned ideas were very important. And this is very characteristic of churches in the modern world. In the modern world, people want to master a subject, and so master's degrees were very important. Experts were very important because it was very much about reason and understanding and digging deeply into subjects, and that's very much like the modern world, committed to reason. The postmodern world is different. This next generation for me is not against reason, but they've rejected the idea of what's called meta-narrative. Uh, meta meta-narrative is a technical term that is used in this whole area. And a meta-narrative is supposedly a big story like uh, science or capitalism or Christianity are seen as meta-narratives, big stories that supposedly interpret everything. Again, reason. But the postmoderns are saying, no, we don't like this meta-narrative. 
we want to experience life in daily life and what's there for us. So where the uh, modern world might collect degrees like PhDs and master's degrees, the postmodern world likes to collect experiences. And so that's why so many postmoderns love to travel and they talk not so much about maybe every book they've read or every degree they got or every kind of scientific thing they've investigated, but they talk more about, hey, have you been to Paris? Hey, have you been to um, America? Have you been to Chicago? Have you been to Moscow? Have you been to um, Spain? And because people like to create and ex create and collect experiences. That's very postmodern. And so in the Church of Jesus Christ, what's happening more and more in a postmodern church is it's all about the experience. People want to go to a church and not just sing traditional hymns, but they want to have a time of worship where they experience God, where their emotions are touched. Very postmodern. They want to go to a, a church where it's not just someone with a master's degree giving all the reasoned arguments, but they want someone who can take them into Scripture and make the stories of Jesus and the stories of the Old Testament live so they can enter into those experiences and, and experience Christ and experience God. That's the kind of postmodern church that is thriving today because it's more about the experience. Henry Blackaby wrote the book, Experiencing God, very popular, and published in many, many cultures because it's all part of this trend. And so um, in modernism, there's a commitment to reason and there's a commitment to observation. In the modern world, People like to go to libraries and observe and read books. In the modern world, people like to go to a museum and they like to see and observe the history of things. And in the modern world, um, there is more and more a commitment to a Sunday morning in a church where people come and they can observe someone teaching, they can be more of a observer of what's happening on Sunday morning. The classic example of this is Willow Creek in America. When Willow Creek was started, it was started by a bunch of high school kids who were in a youth group, but they were still modern in their approach. And so they started a church and there were certain uh, aspects that were postmodern, but one of the things that they did was they only sang one song because they were trying to attract older people and they understood that those older people didn't know the songs and they'd rather come in and just kind of observe and they didn't want to be caught singing. They wanted to observe what was happening in the worship service. Now Willow Creek has moved more and more to being more of a participation. And so now there's uh, much more participation going on in Willow Creek. An example of this is that part of what this means is that this next generation wants to just not, just not go to church and observe what's happening every Sunday. They want to participate on, on God's mission in the community. So the latest thing that Willow Creek has done is they've spent mil millions of dollars to build a center where people can volunteer to help the poor, to provide medical care, to provide food and clothing, to provide all kinds of things for the community because the people don't want to just, this next generation doesn't just want to sit and observe, they want to participate. They want to be on mission with God. Very postmodern. And the churches that are able to make this shift are the ones that are continuing to grow and thrive. In modernism, it's very much about the absolutes. So there are scientists who have the absolute data leading to an absolute conclusion, and that's very important. Accuracy is very important. Experts are very important. Moral absolutes are very important. Right 
and wrong. And so it is that my parents and, and their parents lived in a very much in a right or wrong uh, universe where these absolute truths and absolute moral values were clearly articulated and clearly defined. Well, there's less of that today in this next generation, the postmodern. Rather than looking for absolutes all the time, there's much more of a movement toward an image-based culture. And images, by definition, are rapidly changing. And so movies are really big. And oftentimes, there's no moral absolutes there. It's very relative. And um, image-based things like Facebook is very big because people want to see the image and have a, an experience and Twitter and all kinds of other kinds of social media and the, just the rapid expansion of image-based things. And so now in America, when you go into a church that's very postmodern, there's usually a two-minute video of some kind because this image-driven generation who grew up watching television and doing video games every day is very much oriented not around some kind of a reasoned approach to the text of Scripture, but they're very much about image and stories. And, and so churches that are more and more creative in this kind of a postmodern culture are doing a one or two minute video of a person's testimony. They're doing a, a video of some kind of an interview with people on the street. And they're showing it on Sunday morning to communicate and buttress whatever the message from Scripture is. If I were more postmodern, I'd have videos going on here. I'd have screens flashing. I'd have music blaring. But I'm probably more modern than postmodern, as you can tell. And then finally, um, in the postmodern generation, or in the modern generation, there has been very much a commitment to responsibility. My dad was very responsible. And he taught me to really value being very responsible. And so he worked hard and I worked hard in school and he worked, uh, you know, didn't do much vacationing, not much experience here, but more just very, very responsible to do the next thing to go on to the next responsibility. What happened is, is that a lot of people in my generation, or my parents' generation, they talked about responsibility, but then they were very unresponsible sometimes at home. And this is seen especially in a soaring divorce rate. And so now divorce is more common and, and there isn't that level of responsibility in homes. And so more and more, this postmodern generation is saying, well, man, this gospel of responsibility didn't work too well. And so now this postmodern generation is looking more for uh, not just individual responsibility, but they want to be part of a community. And so in big cities in America, they have what's called urban tribes. And an urban tribe is 20 and 30 year olds who are often single in big cities like Chicago, New York, LA. And these, in these big cities, the way that 20 and 30 year olds survive is they create an urban tribe. There's maybe 10 or 20 people who are friends and they go to the same restaurants and they go to the same parties. And when somebody moves, they help a person move. And they're there for one another because oftentimes their parents aren't. And they're fearful of forming another family. So they form an urban tribe where they can have a sense of community. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. And so what does a church that's really sensitive to this move to postmodernism look like? What does it emphasize? Well, again, what I would uh, encourage you to think about is that 
in the in a church that is moving toward reaching postmoderns, there's going to be, have to be in a, a sense of the experience of God in the worship service. Through through worship that touches the heart, through preaching that tells the stories that move people, through um, a sense that as you left that church, you had a sense that you would experience God that Sunday morning and not just another meeting. The churches that are especially effective in a postmodern world are going to understand this principle of participation, and that is that, that this next generation, for me, doesn't want to just come and sit in a church. They want to be part of mission trips. They want to participate in what's going on in the community. They want to reach out to the poor. They want to be involved in participating in real life, God's mission in the city. And then there's, there needs to be that sensitivity to image that perhaps videos, perhaps the music's on a screen and not just on a sheet of paper, the words for the, the praise choruses or the hymns that are sung. And then that commitment to community. I want to close with one of our churches that I think has done this especially well. The name of the church is North Coast Church. You can Google it and go to northcoast.com. Um, this is a church that's in the association that I serve with. And so I know it quite well. The pastor's name is Larry Osborne. He's been there for many years, over 20 years. And Larry came to a church of about 100, 150 people and struggled to see it grow and not much was happening in terms of what he wanted to really see happen. But by God's grace, uh, God led him to create what I call sermon text-based small groups. And so people would come to the worship service. There was good worship. They were experiencing God there on a Sunday. There was the good, uh, relevant, applicable teaching of Scripture. And then during the week, the people who came to the church would gather in small groups. Someone would host it. Somebody would guide a discussion. And they wouldn't talk about the pastor's sermon. What they did is they talked about the same text of scripture that the pastor had preached on. And so over the years, they continued to refine this sermon text based small groups that aligned with the scripture. And so they were really very postmodern. There was an experience that was good on Sunday, but there was also the participation in a small group during the week. And then that small group would come up with service projects to be involved in participating with those that were in need around them. And there was a, a clear handout that was given during these small groups with uh, questions for people to study ahead of time. And there was a sense of community in that small group, and it didn't just rely on Sunday morning. And so over 25 years, this church has grown to over 9,000 people, and 80% of the people who come on Sunday are in one of these sermon text-based small groups. And it's one of the reasons why the church has grown, because they haven't just relied on a modernism approach to, script, to church, but they've really tried to be postmodern um, in how they're doing and how they're reaching and how they're proclaiming Christ. And I just want to close this session by saying that, you know, the really great thing is, is that Jesus can roar and Jesus is epic. It doesn't matter what culture or world we're looking at. Jesus is alive and Jesus is impacting people right where they are. There's nothing more reasonable than the logos. There's nothing more observable than what God has done in the, this world and nature and all the different things God has done through history. There's nothing more beautiful than the moral absolutes of Scripture and the truth that is embodied in Jesus Christ. There's no one more responsible than Jesus himself. And yet at the same time, we also see that do you want to have the greatest experience there is in the world today? Then get involved in the adventure of the wild goose chase. Get involved in following the Holy Spirit. Get involved with 
finding every day Jesus saying, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That the risen Christ, we can experience him every day. That we can participate in what God is doing in our world. He can lead us in terms of how to serve and how to be dynamic. And Jesus is the icon of God. He's the image of the invisible God. He is the one who brings to us what the Father is. He who has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus said. Paul calls him the icon of God. He is the one that brings us the reality of God. And we see God in the face of Christ. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Certainly Christ is that icon of God. And then the sense of community. He created the church. In every age, the church is that community that we're hungry for. And so isn't it great to know that when we follow Jesus Christ, we are following one who can roar. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's also epic. His resurrection appearances to his apostles and to his disciples. We might not see him face to face yet, but we can experience him in our daily life as we walk with Him in the presence of the Holy Spirit.